from NBC News. This is Today with Bryant Gumbel and Katie Couric, live from Studio 1A. Because another journalist who watched the Simpson interview with special interest is George Curry, the editor of Emerge News Magazine. He's in Washington. Mr. Curry, good morning. Good morning, Brian. What did you think of the interview? Well, I thought it was a very interesting interview. Uh, it was very clear that O.J. wouldn't answer certain things about that night. And, but he did make a, a pretty clear case for how he's living now and his inability to be left alone, as he put it. What did you think about his perceptions of how the public sees him, particularly how the black community now sees him? Oh, I, I think he's totally missing the point. Uh, he's in a land of make-believe if he thinks that people still perceive him the way they perceived him before. The question that, that really, uh, an elongated answer last night was about the African-American community that took him in, even though he was not really a part of it, and then he still, still seems to be uh, uh, set apart from the African-American community, and he did not answer that question well. Do you think he appreciates the extent to which uh, his case may have polarized views among black and white Americans? I'm not so sure he has a reality check on anything. If he thinks that white America still loves him and that he'll still be able to live a, a comfortable life in the United States, I think he needs a reality check. Do you think he came across as sympathetic or unsympathetic? Ne neither necessarily. They don't, there were certain parts that were very human. Uh, his reaction, talking about his wife and his being stalked everywhere. But there was another part that was quite evasive when you start talking about the facts. We wind up our week-long series, America in Black and White. Tonight, the search for common ground. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. One of my African-American colleagues, Michelle McQueen, told me of a conversation starter that is sometimes used within a gathering of blacks. Tell me your lynching story, someone will say. These are not necessarily literal stories of lynching, but stories of painful indignities and sometimes physical assaults. Stories that are shared and passed down from generation to generation. That seemed like a provocative way to begin our discussion. And so I asked our African-American guests if they had any lynching stories that they'd be willing to share. I think white America really doesn't understand the pain and the degradation a person endures uh, when uh, they face racism. I grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and my earliest memory of this is seeing my mother come home. She did domestic work, and she could work all day, clean kitchen, wipe kids' snotty nose, cook. And when she came home, she had to ride in the back seat of a car. And I remember asking my mother, I said, Mama, why do you take this? Why do you ride in the back of that car? And she said, George, I have no choice. This is how I make my living. Uh, one thing Nightline could do, and I would be very interested to hear the answer, is to uh, ask the other group, uh, now that they have been asked what is their lynching story, uh, what is their nicest story? More than a couple. So, somebody's gonna give you a good story. I'm gonna give you one. At least put us in some context. There's a friend of mine. It's a white fellow named Craig, Craig, Craig Trickstead, who, who works for me. We've been doing work with teenage journalists for a long time. About a year and a half ago, he asked me to be the best man at his wedding. Now, I think that's a good question to ask ourselves. How many of you know anyone have ever been to someone where the, where the, where the uh, best man or the maid of honor was a member of the opposite race? Okay. I was <laughs> Me too. See? All right. Not many. Not many. See, my point was, all right, so I was going, let me just move on. So, I, so Craig asked me to be the best man. I went, it was a Lewis in Idaho, so we had to go to Boise. And I went to Boise, and it was some uh, black woman shining shoes. And they said, where are you going? She said, I'm going to Lewis. I'm going to be the best man at my friend's wedding. She said, I bet you he's marrying a white woman, isn't he? I said, yeah, he happens to be white. <laughs> Yes, please, George. Uh, George Curry, editor-in-chief of the National Newspaper Publishers uh, News Service. Uh, there has been a lot of um, photographs and footage out concerning the looting. How widespread is it, and is there any indication that it's dropping off? Well, first I would say it's not nearly as widespread as the focus seems to be when the camera happens to be at those locations. That, that's just a reality. This is a very large country with many cities 
and even the city of Baghdad has many areas. Uh, we believe that it is tapering off the examples of Basra. The limited looting that happened against regime locations in Mosul has come to an end. Uh, some of these were retribution against the regime. Some have gone beyond that, clearly. Uh, but we think that it is already tapering off significantly. It's not an acceptable behavior, behavior for the Iraqi people. And where leaders are stepping forward in communities, it's coming to an end. And we certainly encourage that to happen in as many communities as possible. That's, that's, uh, that's how we're approaching it right now. ABC's John Yang joins us now from Washington with more. Good morning to you, John. Good morning, Juju. A youth gospel choir entertaining this growing crowd here. Ten years ago, this mall was jammed with African-American men for the Million Man March. Now they're calling it the Millions More Movement. And many of the people who were here ten years ago are here again today. So the real test of success this time would be not how many people turn out, but what happens when they go home. George Curry, what do you make of this beyond just the basketball on the cultural side? Look, the NBA players are employees, and they shouldn't be any different from any other employee. If you're working in the world, you have to have a certain attire, a certain dress code. If you want to go to a particular function of black tie, then you dress black tie. If you work for a company, you have casual Friday, you have casual Fridays. I mean, that society and these base, uh, basketball players uh, should not be exempt of them. In fact, the other, the other point is that the successful ones are looking for what are they going to do after they leave the court. You look at Michael Jordan, for example. You never see him dressed like that. He's the most successful one off the court. So if you want to be successful in business later on, there's nothing wrong with requiring a certain dress code when you're talking about league or team functions. Get, get well, like the, the rest of society. 